one thing Colonel uh, Chard and I share, a certain amount of a uh, vertical challenge in our lives. I, I noticed that Jim has cleverly put the tallest speaker later in the day, so when you see Wade Baker come up, you'll have to raise the mic, which is, I think, fitting justice for him. Yes, I've been behind many of those tall podiums there. Anyway, so uh, good morning to everybody. It's great to be here in the great state of West Virginia, and I'm not joking about that. I shared with Jim, actually my family roots uh, just, uh, originate here in West Virginia. Anyone know where Hardy County is? God bless you all. All right, my dad was born in Matthias, West Virginia. Population about 55 and a half or something, whether you count the cattle or not. Uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh, one of a dozen kids, a Depression era uh, a fella, quit school in seventh grade. World War II eventually broke out. He joined the uh, Navy, CB, and a lot in uh, the Aleutians during World War II. Went to the Army afterwards, uh, served a full uh, Army career, then became a civil servant. Uh, worked for the Department of the Army as an instructor, decent mechanic uh, for the rest of his life, and the Army became his way of. Uh, uh, leaving home, seeing the world, getting a great education, and so forth, and that was my launch point into, into public service. I never had any other desire. My dad always hoped I'd go follow him to the Army, by the way, but at that point in my life, I was way too scruffy and way too undisciplined to be in the military, and a little bit too young to get drafted for Vietnam. So I wound up trying to find a way to serve, and um, you know, I was a young uh, mathematician, liberal arts college in, uh, in the hills of uh, Western Maryland, and uh, a fellow came up to me one day, he was a recent graduate of the college, and I was, happened to be standing in the math department, and he said to me, um, so what are you going to do after graduation? I said, I haven't really thought about it. I'm hoping to go work for the Department of the Army. I want to do like modeling of guns and rockets and stuff. I had done some summer uh, jobs like that. He said, well, did you ever think about the NSA? I said, NSA? Is that, that's where they make the rockets and stuff, right? And he goes, no, no, that's NASA, <laughs> the NSA. I had never heard of it. So he hands me a brochure with a phone number. And a couple months later, I'm sitting in a room by myself taking a really hard math test and did just well enough to, to make it into there. And I say it's still the uh, biggest employer of mathematicians in the world. And that started my career uh, at the National Security Agency. And I spent my 34 and a half years at NSA working in the defensive mission, what we now call information assurance, or that is the, the protecting of U.S. systems and trying to figure out what's wrong with them in particular before bad guys figure that out. So uh, after 34 and a half years, I'd kind of done my time. It was time for the next change in my life. And I uh, was looking for the next thing to do, uh, yet stay involved in some of the, the public causes. I'll explain to you a little bit about in just a minute. But the Sands Institute, uh, who I'd been working with as a partner for probably a dozen, 13 years, made me an offer I couldn't refuse, which was not to teach for them. They are the biggest teacher of uh, cybersecurity in the world, but to help run special projects. And this is stuff I love to do. And I call it. Uh, National cat herding. How do I get all the alpha cats in this business to work together? How do I get them to, and cats don't like to be herded, by the way, if you happen to be a cat owner, and I am. They like to go wherever they want to go, and that's the nature of our business. And the challenge is getting people to see common ground. So I'll talk a little bit about kind of the journey. Uh, one of the things Jim promised me, uh, it made me promise that I would not uh, geek out this audience, because I, we know I have a very wide range of backgrounds here. and so. I'll talk as much technical uh, geek as you want to, but it's going to be out the hallway afterwards because I really don't want to scare anybody. And it's more than just being polite to you. It's also a reminder that this business is about people and about plain English, right? So there's a whole language to this stuff that you, that you may or may not understand. Some of us have to live and breathe it. And we grow up in this world of acronyms and inside the beltway talk and so forth. But uh, we forget sometimes that's how we talk to ourselves, right? practitioners within the business, and the rest of the world, you have jobs to do, right? You have missions, you have functions, you have things, and you don't get to spend all day thinking about this. I came up in an earlier talk. You got 15 minutes to think about security if you would get that chance during the day. <coughs> Geeks like us, we live in breathing. So I'll do my best to turn on the usual, uh, universal uh, plain language translator here and not scare you guys away with, the, with what I've done. So I uh, started as a mathematician, but you know, for me, and this tells you how old I am, uh, I switched from math to computer science at NSA in about 1980 or 81 when I realized the government would buy me an Apple II Plus to have on my desk. <laughs> wow! That was a $2,500 computer back in those days, right? I took the only computer course my college offered, the only one, and it was a miserable experience. Anybody remember those days when the computer was in the back room? And you carried a big card deck? No, it was in Morgantown. It was in Morgantown. <laughs> you had the 300 baud dial-up modem with acoustic couplers. I know that's, sorry, geeking out here. But you had to carry a big deck of 
punched cards. And you had to be real nice to the guy that worked the counter so you could get two runs through in a day. You know, that was the first time I, by the way, ever saw a, a grown military officer cry. <laughs> the young Lieutenant Hotshot, who was the programmer for this agency I uh, had a summer job with, were walking across the parking lot carrying these gigantic card decks of the Fortran program. And he stubbed his toe. And you know what happened, right? Yeah. Those cards went <laughs> across a hundred foot of parking lot, just like that. And uh, he just sat down on the curb. <laughs> and tears rolled down his eyes because he knew it was going to take him weeks to recover from that. And I just thought, oh my god, this is what computer guys do. I, this, is not, this is not for me. I'm never going to get involved in this stuff. But that was the kind of state of the art. But then this idea of having a computer on your desk. right? Now we've got computers in our pockets, on our wrists, that are more powerful than what we had back then. This is an amazing time to be a consumer, right? to be someone who wants information, who wants to interact with others, who wants to learn. This is amazing. How many of you remember that and say, okay, got, this is an age test for you. You don't have to raise your hand if you're embarrassed. How many of you remember when the first set of encyclopedias came into your home? When your father bought a set of encyclopedias. I remember it. Yeah. Funk and Wagnalls. Anyone remember Funk and Wagnalls? That was the brand that my dad brought home. Used. And we were, the kids were so thrilled. We had our own encyclopedias. We didn't have to go to the library. We could just read. And now you expect to be. My kids are digital natives. Right? Many of you are young enough to be digital natives. You expect to be reading from any library on earth. You expect to be connected to every university information store. There. You expect to be connected to any uh, financial resource. Right? You're, you're, my kids are irritated if the internet goes out for 30 seconds. I mean, they, they expect different of the technology than folks of my generation. We're still amazed by it. They're just accepted. That's the difference. But what happens is it brings with us a certain danger, right? This all happened. I, I used to say in DOD, um, DOD talks, uh, did I miss the meeting? When did we decide it was a good idea to share our network with the bad guys? Was I not there? I would have voted against that, right? Well, guess what? There was no such meeting. The internet just evolved. It happened, right? From a mix of government investment and commercial investment and great minds at universities. And it all kind of happened on us, uh, fortunately, frankly, before the government figured it out. And so now we have this notion of universal connectivity, access to any information store on Earth. We conduct our commerce, right? Our national treasure is sitting out there somewhere on wires and in servers, represented as digital bits. It's a really weird time. And we didn't think so much. As consumers, what do we demand? We demand service, right? We demand information. We demand connectivity. And that security stuff, those gangs will figure that out sometime later. Well, guess what? We've let you down. We haven't quite figured it out yet. So it's a dangerous time. We share the network with every good guy, bad guy, and in between on Earth. And that leads to all the consequences that, that folks talked about. So just a word or two. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little about something called the uh, Top 20 Critical Security Controls. I'm going to attempt to speak to you in plain English. If it doesn't work, hang in there. I'll do my best. And the, the tagline I put there, from best practice common practice. I'll explain that just a second. Um, but one other thing. Uh, I see You see two job titles there. Uh, one is director uh, at the, the Sands Institute. That's kind of my first part-time job. One of the things I figured out about retirement, and I'm having trouble explaining this one to my wife, that the sum total of my part-time commitments after retirement seem to be adding up to more than 1.0. And I'm not sure how that's happening, but it sure is. And the second job I'll explain at the end is a director of programs at something called the Council on Cybersecurity. So uh, I promised you I wouldn't geek you guys out on technology, but I've got to give you one math equation. Bear with me. I'll explain it in plain English. Because you need to know where I'm coming from, right? When and people use these terms, cyber security, information security, information assurance, communication security, computer security, I have lived through them all. Right? I started as what's called a ComSec or communication security intern. Uh, this is what I call the, uh, the bureaucratic Jedi mind trick. You have to reinvent yourself with a fancier name every five years and reorganize. Therefore, I went from a ComSec person to an InfoSec person to a CompuSec person to an information assurance person, and now I, now I are a cyber person. right? And that's just the nature of the evolution of the, of the sort of bureaucratic naming, but also the, the thinking about the problem is being bigger and bigger. It's not just about technology. It's about information. It's not just about information. It's about our confidence and so forth. But this, this uh, is what I would call the classic risk equation. Because people throw this term, these terms around all the time. 
threats, vulnerability, its consequences, you know, all this hazards, et cetera, et cetera. This is how old guys and computing guys, gals in computer security think about this. I'll read this equation to you in plain English. Your risk, and we are all in the risk business, whether we know it or not, is a function of these variables. It's a function of your vulnerability, the threats, the consequences. And a few people stick a countermeasures underneath there as kind of the denominator or the way you manage those variables. So those are the key variables you have to think about. So we're really in the business of risk. And everything we think about and every action we take is in this context, whether you know it or not. That is, how can I minimize my vulnerability? How can I make sure that I'm not weak, even if I don't know there's a real bad guy? How can I design my system so I'm not vulnerable? So that even if I don't understand the threat very well, I'm pretty safe. The problem is, you can't afford to spend your entire national treasure on minimizing your vulnerability, right? In fact, vulnerability is something you want to do fairly cheap. You want it to be off the shelf. You want to buy it. You want to configure it. You don't want to have to create it from scratch. You want to minimize how vulnerable you are to lots of these different types of threats, but you don't want to spend a ton of money doing it. Doing it. I'll explain why. Threats are different. Threats are about bad people and their intentions and their capability, right? Their actions and what they want to do to you. What what is their desire? To steal money from you? To embarrass you? To make you less confident in your systems if you're a military commander? So threats often take you to people and nations and intentions. It's a subtler, a well, little fuzzier to get a hold of. Right? It's very challenging to think about threats. And you can never assume you have it 100% figured out. Right? Because you don't really know all the threats out there against you. Consequences are about the things you care about. I love your, uh, what, what's the, uh, the uh, alternate name you have for this event? Money, trust, uh, security, how much you're willing to, to lose. Those are mostly about consequence, right? How much consequence are you willing to absorb or put up with? How much money are you willing to lose? How much security? How much trust are you willing to give up in your systems in exchange for convenient shopping, for example? Right? That's the decisions that we kind of make implicitly every day. And then countermeasures are the way we deal with these things. What am I willing to spend? What am I willing to do? What am I willing to give up so I get more? So that I can manage this risk. You have to think of this, again, this is the way I think of it, is how do I manage all these variables, each of which I have to measure separately, manage separately, and I have different levels of control over. And they're often dealt with by different people. Right? So vulnerability is where I grew up. I have spent my entire professional life studying vulnerability from a wee little lad mathematician at NSA. Mostly, how do we break our own systems before the bad guys figure it out? And that's where I've spent my time. I'm one of the lead security guys in both math and computer science, and then I have the great honor and privilege to run the, the massive organization at NSA for defense that worries about this kind of stuff, 7, 700 people or so. Everybody who tests for defense at NSA, whether they test mathematics, product systems, operational things like red teams. So red teams are when you pay good people to come test you. To maybe do an assessment like the Senator Guard talked about, right? Blue teams are the happy, friendly folks that show up and figure out how do I, you know, how can we configure your system better? Where are you weak? Let's let's work together to try and solve this problem. And you know, I've been involved in the stand up and institutionalization of those kinds of things over over several decades now. Uh, when when I say critical security controls, though, I want you to think of one thing: the countermeasures. Right, so controls is kind of the fancy, techie word for what do I do? Controls are actions that I take or things I put in place to help me manage this equation. And controls can be anything from uber techy things like firewalls and you know uh, access control lists and things like that to train my people, right? to make them be more aware, to give them uh, the tools to recognize when fraud is occurring on the net. So think of controls as countermeasures or controls as actions that you can take, things that you can buy, things that you can do in order to help you manage this problem here. Well, if, you, if you're like me, so again, I said I'm, I'm doing my best to give you the plain English version of everything because it's really important, right? It's not talking down, it's talking to. But guess what? Here's one of the mysteries of the business, if you're actually in this, in this business here. Even the practitioners don't agree on what these words mean. So when I go to these meetings, we talk about standards, controls, best practices, compliance, assessment, vulnerability guidelines. Everybody means different. 
you can find any three experts that agree you're doing better than I am. And that's part of the mystery of the business, right? It's what I would call a wizardry business. The leading minds in this business are very smart people, very clever and creative. But you have to remember this. I'm actually a liberal arts mathematician, so I think about history a lot, sociology. The business that we now call cybersecurity is actually pretty immature. It's not all that old. Compare it to things like medicine, right? mechanical engineering, civil engineering. You have anywhere from decades to hundreds to centuries to thousands of years of experience built up, body of knowledge, uh, expected behaviors, right? principles. You have lots of things that have built up over a long period of time to organize, to codify, to make official where it's appropriate behaviors. We're in a business that's relatively immature by those kinds of standards. I'll talk about some of the steps that we need to to, to do that. But we've got a long ways to go, and I always feel like I'm living in a cloud because people throw terms around, and it's a real struggle to try and get to common meaning. Because if you're trying to solve different problems, then no conversation will, will get you to, to where you want to be. So this is my life inside the Bellway, I'll tell you. So let me kind of repeat the title, from best practice to common practice. What does that mean? Well, it sounds so easy, right? Best, best practice. We take the best thing and let make everybody do it. Wouldn't that be the right thing to do? Well, it sounds so easy. It sounds so tempting. So I had a conversation with a multi-star general about probably 10, 10 years ago. And it was about what we were going to do working with some partners like uh, NIST, the National Institute of Science and Technology, and others, to standardize the configuration of a federal desktop. Bear with me on the deep part, right? How should my Windows desktop or my Linux desktop or my Mac OS desktop be set up for best security? And what we were trying to do was organize that in a way to make it standard, to make it delivered off the shelf, not, not everyone has to do it on their own, to work directly with a vendor, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm describing this to a multi-star general who are uh, notably strong personalities, and he looks at me with pity after a few minutes and goes, well, Tony, all you're describing is commercial best practice. And of course, the un, unstated part of it, we're the, we're the DOD. We must be doing much better than commercial best practice. And I looked at him and I said, well, sir, yeah, that might be true. I said, but if only the DOD could aim for the lofty heights of commercial best practice, we'd actually be better off than we are today. And he, he wouldn't believe it. I, I knew it to be true for a fact, right? I had red teams roaming all around the DOD and you know, examining what was going on. It was pretty chaotic at that time, 10, 12 years ago. Everybody was left on their own to figure out how to secure their own desktop, their own system, and it was done at a local level, a base level, you know, at a command level, but it was pretty much haphazard. He was assuming we're the big bad DOD, right? We've got all this money and great people, and we must be doing better than commercial. No, it wasn't true. He just had no idea that it could be different than that. So I said, the first thing, number one, if we could only aim for the lofty heights, we'd be better off. Number two, they call it best practice for a reason. It's not actually very common. It stands out. And he had trouble understanding it. So that little notion has been in my brain for about 10 years. And that's why it's the, the, the logo for the new uh, nonprofit that I'll talk to you about in just a second. But this idea of how is best practice? What is best practice? Remember, we work in this wizardry business, I call it, right? If you can get any two or three experts to agree, you're doing great. So the notion of best is not clear at all. Experts disagree every minute of every day. If you run in consultants, you know exactly what I mean. Right? You get a different opinion every time. It's challenging. It's not that people are trying to lie to you. It is, in fact, very challenging. I mentioned some other fields like medicine, civil engineering. Guess what we don't have yet in this immature business? We don't have the equivalent of things like the laws of material science, the rules of physics. Right? When you build a bridge, again, there's hundreds, thousands of years of history. There's laws of physics that tell us certain materials have certain strengths, or certain materials um, configured a certain way or shaped a certain way have particular strengths. And we can design our systems appropriately. How, how big will the largest load we expect it to carry? We can over-design it for a little bit of safety. When a bad thing happens, we learn from it. Right? When we have a hurricane of unexpected force, and it puts a certain portion on the bridge, and we realize, you know what, we didn't account for that in our equations. We have to rethink the design right, of the bridge with either better materials or different designs. We can learn from the disasters, right, 
feedback, learn from the disasters of the past, so we can design again for the next, and we can decide, you know, the, the notion of like a hundred year floodplain and things like that. So we have codified a lot of behaviors in a lot of uh, engineering disciplines. Those kinds of things do not exist in this business that we're talking about today. In medicine, we've got lots of both history, we have experimentation, and we have developed basic science around chemistry and brain physics and all kinds of things that go on that allow us to think about problems and reason and build models and therefore design uh, treat courses of action, treatments, etc. that allow us to think about this business differently. So this notion of best is not perfect, by the way. Right? Do you ever feel like your doctor is experimenting on you? Sometimes it feels like to me. So they, they're learning, right? These are learning, growing systems where the knowledge is not fixed. We happen to be working in a field where the knowledge is quite fuzzy and growing so rapidly that we're having trouble codifying it. So there's a notion here that's really hard to get a handle of. I, I, I uh, spent a lot of time, probably eight years ago, talking to a number of folks in the insurance industry about this business, right? You can go to many of the insurance companies and buy what's called uh, cyber insurance. And if, if you find the right, so, so this, is, this could have been my other career path. The other thing I considered was actuarial science, by the way. So your insurance rates are actually determined by wonky mathematicians. You know that, right? Actuaries. We sit in the back room cranking out models based upon uh, birth rates, death rates, rates of disease, and all this kind of stuff. Building mathematic, mathematical models, it sounds kind of macabre, doesn't it? Figuring out the probability of you living any given amount of time. And they have to have this as a basis so they can decide what to charge you, charge you a little more so they can make some money. Right? So there's a notion of science under the hood, a mathematic, mathematical modeling that allows them to the insurance industry to thrive. They can do that because they have data. Right? They've got lots of data. But I remember talking to a, the, the lead math guy uh, for one of the big reinsurance companies, and we were talking about the challenge of cyber insurance. He said, he says, Tony, the problem is, and this image always stuck with me, we cannot figure out what the cyber equivalent of Florida is. The cyber equivalent of Florida. What he meant was, when you think about hurricanes in Florida, right? we have great maps of the terrain, we know what uh, the, the paths of hurricanes have been for the last 100 years, we know what time of year, we know the weather conditions that lead to them, we know where they typically go, we know what it costs to rebuild a house, we know what it costs to rebuild a city, you know, we've got data, we've got all these things that allow us, you know, with some, some uh, probability of error, to have a pretty decent model of what it will take, of what could happen, of what the probability event, the, prob the cost of recovery. And therefore, they can build costing models around that and sell you insurance. We're not there yet, right? We're still in the business where, where if you ask people, uh, if you look across the industry estimates for what do the recovery cost is, it's everything from $3 billion to a buck ninety-eight to recover from these cyber incidents that you hear about. So it's hard to have an insurance uh, model if you have this sort of wide variation, basically guessing, as to what's going on, what it would cost to recover. So all these kinds of things. We don't have kind of the things that are expected in this business, right? Notions of basic practice. Due diligence, these are legal terms, uh, you know, uh, expected behaviors, what should, what should you do. When we think of even simple things like hygiene, you know, cleanliness around the home, right? we do a number of things because we think they provide value, whether they really do or not. Right? We wash our hands at regular points during the day. We do that because there's a, there's a probability, however small, that you could have germs, or you could pick up germs, and you'd like to minimize that. So you put hand sanitizer, you wash your hands, and you do that. You don't cough into people's faces, etc. Right? We do a number of things that we believe the medical community thinks uh, provide some value. We do them automatically. If you don't do them, how is it? How is that behavior reinforced? People shun you, right? If you if you engage in behaviors that people find unacceptable, they tell you, they shun you, etc. Some of these things, as they become better understood, they can become codified in things like building codes, right? practices, things like I've got to get my kids have to get shots before they're allowed into a school. Right? We codify certain things uh, in a rigorous way. We build them into other practice things like building codes. And then others we build into things like certifications of people. So when you go to a mechanic, right, I do not have the time or expertise to interview a mechanic well enough to know if he's qualified to work on my car. I just don't. Right? If I had that kind of skill, I would do it myself. I look for a little seal on the door. Right? I look for a certification. If I go to the doctor, I know he's got a diploma. He's certified you know, by a board of practitioners that he's in fact qualified to do this. We just accept that. Right? Well, guess what? Those didn't happen overnight. Those happened over centuries. So these kind of things are part of this notion of how to get, how to get from best to common. 
But here's my experience after all these years. Everything that you need to know to defend yourself in terms of technology, in terms of information about bad guys, etc., anything you need to know, anything you could want, is actually out there someplace. Right? It's in the marketplace. Somebody's got it. Somebody knows it. Somebody could tell you. The problem is you can't find them because it's so vast. So this is the notion of best practice. How can I find it? How can I connect with it so that it can become my practice? Right, so we've heard some great examples from the opening speakers. West Virginia is right on the edge of this. So got this, this idea might be called Security Practitioners uh, Forum or a group, something like that. That idea is a big idea. It's an important idea that connects people in uniform, people who work in the uh, government systems, people who work in private industry. We all face this together. So bringing these things together is really important because, my, again, my experience has been, maybe it's not 100%, but 99.9% of what you need to know is out there someplace. The problem is you can't figure out where. <coughs> and you don't have the time to talk to everybody on Earth to figure out how can they help you. So how can we bring information together? That's kind of the mission and one of the underlying themes of this notion of critical controls. And, and let me just tell you, security guys get this wrong all the time. Remember I told you, this is a tough field to be in, right? There's a lot of new knowledge happening all the time. Security professionals struggle to get it right and to get the risk part of this right. I'll tell you a quick, quick uh, story. Uh, so so in, in contrast to most of NSA folks, I, I've made a very public career of my time and I've done a lot of work with the public. So part of that, I was honored to be the uh, keynote speaker for Black Hat and DEF CON in 2007. And it was kind of a coming out party for all the uh, work that my folks had done to uh, create great security guidance that we started giving away to the public in 2001. If you ever looked at NSA.gov and downloaded an NSA security guide or saw NSA work and, and standards and so forth, that's my folks. Right? I led that campaign starting in about 2000, early, late 2000, early 2001, right before 9-11, to have all that released to the public and just make that a part of what we do. So in 2007, I was honored to go speak at the biggest hacker conferences in the world, Black Hat, DEF CON. Black Hat being a little more corporate, DEF, DEF CON being a little more scruffy in the <laughs> uh, Vegas. So I'd never been out there, didn't know if they were going to greet the NSA guy with uh, torches and pitchforks or uh, whatever. Uh, so I get out there the day before, and this is about how security guys don't always get the security stuff right there. So I go out there. And I'm a little early, so in Caesar's Palace, I go up to the top floor where the registration is, and I go up there, and here's who I am. And I'm out public with Tony Sager from NSA. They need to see an ID. They look at me with a mix of fear and sympathy, and I'm not sure what it is, but here I am. And they look at my ID, and they look at me, and they look at me. Oh, okay, so you're the NSA guy. Here's your badge. Welcome, et cetera, et cetera. So start. Well, it's the afternoon before. I'm the speaker at 9 o'clock the next morning. So I'm riding down the escalator. If you've ever been to Caesar's Palace, really, really, really long escalator. And there aren't many people around. And I'm riding down the escalator from the top floor and look in front of me, and there's a guy who's clearly a black hat. He's dressed in black from head to toe. He's got a black roller black bag. He's got a cell phone in his ear, and he's going down the escalator about 10 in front of me. I got a little map. I'm trying to figure out. I've never been to Vegas, so I'm looking at the map trying to figure out where I am. And I noticed the guy wave to somebody off in the distance. But there was something you know, it was there was something awkward about that wave. I'd never seen that before. So I look up and he waves again. But his whole body is stiff like this when he waves. That's really weird. And then I look, and much to my horror, he starts leaning forward, and I realize. He's going to fall down the escalator. Stiff as a board, he goes, boom, lands on the escalator, flips head over heels. His body is on the bottom landing, and his head is up on the escalator, about three steps up, right? The escalator is receding into his head. And I'm just, oh my god, time is standing still. And I run down this escalator, complete adrenaline. There's not a conscious thought in this brain. Leaped over him grabbed him by the feet, and I did have one conscious thought. Notice the follically challenged here. I said, oh, his hair is getting caught in the escalator. I pulled him away. So I grabbed him by the feet, and I dragged him away. And a big streak of blood is coming. He's, he's cut pretty good. and He, he survives. No, no panic here. So I pull him away. He's shaking violently. And then I realize what I should have realized. He's having a stroke. 
his eyeballs are rolled up in his head. He's shaking violently and choking. And I just grab his head, turn his head, you know, because he's choking. And I look around and I don't see a soul. Oh my gosh, what is going on here? This is like crazy. And I look up, security person comes running over. What's going on? I think the guy's having a stroke. She says, I'm going to help hang in there. I look up again. There's three people standing at my feet. And, they said, and I said, do you guys know what to do? The guy's having a stroke. And the one guy, uh, Brad the Nurses, Brad the Nurse is a famous character in, in hacker literature, but he looks at me and he goes, well, of course, we're all emergency room nurses. I'm kneeling on the floor holding this guy. Go, well, fix this guy. What are you guys doing here? So, if you're doing fine, just don't let him hurt himself. Wait for the EMTs. So chaos it starts to ensue. People are running up and all that kind of stuff. And a lady comes running over, another security guard, hands me a towel. Here, put this under the guy's head. I, and I'm just, I'm completely shook up at this point. I'm just lost. I run over, wash my hands. There's a point to the story. Hang in there. Wash my hands a few times. Wow, I can't believe it. It all happened. I come walking out. Big crowd now is gathered, of course. EMTs are there. Stretcher is there. The guy's sitting in a mobility scooter that was loaned to him by somebody else. And the guy is now recovered slightly. His eyeballs are kind of back. But he's dazed. And I'm walking up from here, and he's looking here, and the EMT is looking right in, like six inches from his nose, just nose to nose, yelling at him. Tony, Tony, are you all right? Are you all right? And I'm walking up, still dazed. I go, oh, isn't this a small world? That guy's name is Tony. Isn't that something? And I walk up, and the EMT is yelling at this guy, nose to nose. And I look over, and the EMT is holding my registration badge <laughs> in his hand. Uh, uh, excuse me, is, 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 is that guy named Tony? Because that's my badge. You. You're Tony Sager? Who's this guy? I said, I don't know. He's some guy that fell down the escalator. <laughs> Just at that moment, the lady who had, who had arranged for me to be there, the head of public relations for Black Hat, comes running up. She goes, literally at that moment, she goes, you're Tony Sager? I said, yeah. She goes, I heard you just fell down the escalator. You're my 9 o'clock speaker. I, I, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> the next guy comes running up. He goes, yeah, I heard the head of security for the NSA fell down the escalator. <laughs> and then he badly hurt. So this spreads like wildfire. So, you know, I've got people, friends all over the industry, they're running up to me, what happened to you? And I spent the next two days unraveling this mystery. By the time we got the black hat uh, to DEF CON, which is the scruffier one, you know, kids all in black, the piercings and everything like that. And they were great to me, by the way. But the, the story then became the NSA guy threw one of our hacker brothers down the stairs. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't win. But the point was, the security guys got it wrong. They carefully checked my ID. They didn't issue me my credentials right, without a check, but there was nothing on that credential that was associated with me any longer. Anybody who held that badge was now me. Right? Now, they could have put a photograph on there, but the black hat folks, the people registered, looked at the risk equation. What's the possible consequence? Somebody sneaks into a party with somebody else's badge, right? We'll put up with that. Because the cost of the countermeasure to put photographs on the badge was too high. It would have been expensive. It would have delayed the registration for hours. Not worth it. They made a risk calculation. But the calculation failed us in this particular case, right? It worked for the general case. That tells you how hard it is to get these things right. Oh, okay, so let's back to this common practice. The other, here's the other big problem that I've hinted at. I call it, uh, actually, the name of the, it's called Calabrese's Razor. This is the business that folks like Wade and I work in. I've long held the opinion that the community of information security experts agree with each other 90% of the time. Sounds pretty good. But they waste 90% of their time arguing to the death with other experts about that last 10%. That quote is so good and so true, I wish I had said it first. And I got this from a friend of mine, Hal Pomerantz, from his blog a few years ago. That's the nature of the business, right? 90% of the time, we actually agree. There's a lot of smart, really opinionated people in this business who love to argue that last 10% to death. And they will waste their time, their energy to prove who's smarter. And my view is, let's get over each other. Let's get over it. Because that 90% can actually protect us from almost everything. So let's focus on that. That's a life philosophy for me as a public servant. You know, as a technical professional here. It is so hard to get people to agree to this stuff. And it's not that people are evil or bad or whatever. It's just that they're smart and opinionated. Okay? And you have to remind us all every once in a while to see the common good, that the greater good is served by collaboration agreement 
than by trying to prove who's smarter, right? Now, the NSA guy is smarter than this guy, is smarter than this guy, is smarter than the Air Force guy. Is. That's the kind of arguments that people want to make under the hood. You know, that's the implied difference. So this is about how can we trust each other? Who can we find that we can trust? How do we get the experts to stop debating each other and start putting their brains together to help each other? And that's kind of the notion. I tell you all this for a reason, because this is kind of underlying the critical controls, the way we think about this. So what was I trying to do? The critical security controls, and the reason I agreed to take this on its hands, was it actually started one afternoon at NSA. And there's a phenomenon that I call the fog of more. All right, when you're old in this business, so remember this, I grew up in the 70s in this business. Those were actually pretty simple and quaint days by today's standards. Anybody old enough to remember when the U.S. only had one enemy? <laughs> the Soviet Union. Anybody remember going out the hallway and putting your head under the desk and that kind of stuff in case the bomb ever came? Right? We had one enemy. That's what we cared about. And guess what? They were a closed society. They didn't actually tell us very much about themselves. Right? It was hard to figure out. Remember I talked about threats? What's their motivation? What's their capabilities? We didn't actually know much about them. They were very close about that. So if you're faced with a danger and you don't understand all the risks involved, all the parameters of how, whether it's a hurricane or, a, or adversary, a nation state, if you don't really understand much about them, what is your temptation? Your temptation is to assume the worst, design for the worst. Assume the worst. Assume that they know everything, that they can do anything, that they're 10 feet tall, they're mathematicians, they're just as smart as ours, et cetera, et cetera. They get all the computing power in the world, et cetera. They collect everything we say. You have to assume the worst, design for the worst. That's how nuclear weapon systems have been designed ever since they started. Okay, I've worked a lot in that business. Believe me, that's the way you do it. You assume the worst. Guess what? The nation can no longer afford to do those kind of things, either in time or in money. We can't afford to do that. This problem is changing too fast. Right? So this is a much more dynamic issue. But guess what? We actually know more about threats than we ever did before. Right? It was not the Soviet Union. The bad news is it's everybody. It's every teenager in uh, former Soviet bloc countries that's looking to steal your credit card. It's everybody and their brother is both your friend and your adversary on any given day. So it's very challenging to figure out how to do that. But here's an interesting thing. We actually have more defensive tools more advice, more consultants, more compliance, more oversight, more help for you than we have ever had in our entire history. Isn't that astounding? We have all these tools, all these vendors, all these integrators, consultants who just can't wait to take your checks and do great things for you. We got it all. But the problem is what I call the fog of more. We have so much stuff now, it paralyzes us as a community. We're having trouble getting to that 90% where people agree. We're just surrounded by this kind of stuff. And especially his state and locals. I, I say this with a, a, a lot of uh, interaction with the MSI SAC and, and lots of state governments. <laughs> because with all respect to the wonderful humans that work in state and local government, you guys cannot afford to buy your way out of this problem. Right? The money just isn't there. A big company, a Goldman Sachs, an American Express, these guys have lots of money. And if they don't have enough, they charge you more. They can afford the best defenses ever the best information services, right? And they're not perfect either. They're great, and they're great Americans working in these companies. Really. But state and locals are usually working on a shoestring. They're trying to do the best they can with tight budgets, tight constraints. And so you have to think more creatively about this problem when you're resource constrained. And so you've got to think about who can help you, not how do I do it myself, because right? you just aren't going to have the resources to buy it yourself. So this idea of fog of war, we're surrounded by all this stuff. If I look at the problem from my perspective, from NSA, from all the advice as I mentioned, we started giving stuff away in 2001. We started you know, working with lots of folks, reaching out to non-traditional by NSA standards communities to help them with this problem. Working with the, the major industrial suppliers, with the integrators, and so forth. And I looked around at our customer base, which was the DOD, intelligence community, and folks like that, and guess what? They're still struggling. I figured, man, if the, if the federal government can't get a handle on us, what is the problem? So the problem is they're besieged by this ball of more. They're not really sure what to do next. They're not sure where to spend the next dollar. They're not sure who to trust. So I grabbed the, the head of the red team, the technical lead, the blue team, the uh, dark side of NSA, probably half a dozen of the smartest folks that I knew. 
right? I invited them to my office. I said, nobody leaves the room <laughs> until we agree on a small number of things that we think all our friends should do. Okay? To stop the red team next time, to stop the real bad guys you know, as we observe them. Small number. What are the first steps? And to me, small was five to seven. I said, five to seven is our target. Small number of things. They don't have to be easy, but they have to be clear. Actionable things that people need to do to stop bad guys, to stop us when we pretend to be bad guys, etc. Well, of course, the price of consensus is uh, it's hard to stay down to five, so we wound up with ten. So that ten got written up in a letter that went down to the Pentagon and to, to the Air Force CIO and some other friends in the business who had been asking for something like that. And the Sands Institute got a hold of this about four years ago. And uh, the, the beauty of SANS, uh, this is not a commercial, but the SANS Institute has its worldwide reach. The power is in their mailing list of alumni. Hundreds of thousands of people have taken their classes. And so they can reach really far, and they're the masters of what I would call community consensus. So, they, so uh, Alan Power, the owner of SANS, called me and said, I saw your 10 list, which was unclassified. Could I take it and use it as the basis of a community consensus project? I said, sure, I can't stop you, but can we work with you on it? Absolutely. So that got distributed to thousands of people to comment on, and the 10 became 20. Okay, this notion of a top 20 list of actions that everybody ought to take. And it was originally known by something called the Consensus Audit Guidelines, because the notion was we ought to be auditing against these guidelines. I decided to drop that name uh, a year ago. I'll explain in a second. So the idea was coalesce a lot of smart people who represent the entire, you might call, ecosystem. People who study the threat for a living, people who study technology, who study defense, who study vulnerability, get them to put their heads together and try to agree. And this is what I call the large cat herding, right? Getting people to stop focusing on that 10% and arguing to, to death and focus on the 90% that turns out they already agree on. So it got embodied in this thing called the top 20 critical security controls. Uh, when I came to SANS uh, in July uh, last year, uh, one of the things they asked me to take a look at, so I went to SANS to run special projects, not to uh, be involved in the teaching, and they asked me to look at this um, critical security controls thing. And uh, so I thought about it some more, and uh, there were two quick conclusions. But one of them was I said, if we, if we want to change the world, and we have the opportunity to change the world, then number one, we've got to stop calling it the consensus audit guidelines. Number one, because I can't find enough auditors who have agreed to it yet. So it's very presumptuous to say you have consensus among auditors when you don't, in fact, have that. But let's go back to the sort of traditional name of critical security controls, right? Steps that you can take, countermeasures, as I, as I mentioned earlier, in that risk equation. The other is, I said, we need to bring in other partners, people that really understand and that people believe understand what the problem really is. So I reached out to friends. It's perfect to have Wade Baker here, by the way, one of the great guys in the business from Verizon, because Wade is one of the folks that I reached out to, to talk to about this. I said, we need more people that do nothing but study threat for a living, that are actively involved in helping people deal with the threat, clean up from the threat, analyze the threat, and have real understanding, and are willing to put that understanding on the table. So if you've ever seen, I'm sure for, uh, Wade will talk to you about the Verizon Data Breach Report later. It is one of the, cl the class products of the business. Uh, highly respected, uh, very well done, tremendous uh, focus and data a basis to it. Wade will talk to you about it. But the idea was, let's go find those folks and make sure that they're really aligned with the critical controls. Because the idea is, we need to stop the problems that we're really seeing, right? Not those 10% problems that people postulate about and dream about and might happen someday, but the real problems that are happening, that are happening someday. So this idea from get a few friends together, people that I knew and trusted, you know, really bright people, very committed, very experienced. Expand that out. Make sure that we cover the entire ecosystem of friends. Bring them all together. And this, what I would call the biggest problem here, you know, people talk about threat sharing. We do need to do a much better job about sharing vulnerabilities and threats, et cetera. But here's what the real challenge is in this business. It's not the sharing, it's the translation. It's the translation. If you had access to every bit of threat information that exists in the world today, whether from NSA, CIA, Verizon, Symantec, McAfee, if you had access to all that, you would be overwhelmed. You wouldn't know what to do with it. Believe me, okay? I've seen a lot of that stuff. It's the translation 
And it's the understanding of it, the analysis, the categorization, the binning of it, the conclusions you can draw, and then the translation of it into action. Thanks for telling me about 500,000 things, but what's the, what small number of steps can I do so I don't have to track every one of those 500,000 things, right? None of us can do it on our own. So this translation step is the really hard one that has not that has not been done well by folks like me as a community. And that's what we're trying to do with controls, to do translation for you, right? to do it as a community. And when you look at the participants of a uh, of the critical control project and things like that, and we're not the only one that's like this. If you look at the participants, you go, you know what, I really want to know what Wade and his folks think is rising. Because they do a lot of this work and they collect a lot of data and they do great analysis. And I, but I also want to know what those guys think and those guys think and those guys think. I want to pull all that together. Right? I can't afford to pay them all. I don't have the time to chase all this down. But I need their insight. How can I get their knowledge translated into what steps I need to take? That's the kind of problem that we need to solve as a big community here. Right? So it's not so much the sharing. It's the translation. I think it's, it's really the, the major problem. here. So that's kind of the background that got, got me started on this. Uh, yeah, I mentioned the original uh, contributors and the people involved. It's kind of a who's who. Uh, it really started as a government-y kind of thing. And, but uh, if you look today, we've got great contributors from you know, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, uh, Citibank, you know, lots of great adopters. There are a lot of great examples of state and local governments. People like, who, who, likes, who really likes this story? The underfunded. Right, the lonely, the folks that don't have big budgets, they are big believers. Nonprofits, faith-based organizations. We're about to start a big project with the Red Cross and folks like that around for small and medium businesses. Right? Many, sm like, uh, many small and medium businesses, I think this applies to state and locals also. Many of you don't even have the time to read the stuff you're supposed to comply with. Right? It's so overwhelming, all the regulations and compliance things. You, you just, you, you, big companies, pay a room full of people to do that on their behalf, just to understand what they're required to do. Most of us don't have the energy or the time or the expertise to do that. We need to get to some place pretty quickly. Right? What actions do I need to take now? That doesn't solve the problem. That's not the end of world hunger as we know it. That means, how do I get started? How can I get this sort of classic 80-20 you know, Pareto principle sort of a thing in place? How can I take the fewest steps to get the most return that's what we all need to be focused on. So this is kind of the who's who. It's uh, greatly expanded now. There, um, the growth of controls now has, uh, every month I get a new translation. There's translations of the controls in Russian, Swedish, French, Spanish. Someone's working on it. There's a bunch of these things that are just coming out of Nobody's getting paid to do this. People are just doing this. Isn't that amazing? This sort of spirit of uh, community involvement. Uh, I won't, again, I won't geek you out on this stuff. The controls are these. Uh, if, if you are a practitioner in the business, you probably know what these are, but uh, none of these is rocket science. Right? They're all simple things. If you want a fancy poster from the SANS Institute, uh, you can get one. I don't have a box card up in here, but lots of great information. Uh, give me a business card after this talk. I'll be glad to have them send you one. Or you can go to the website and then log in and uh, get on the mailing list for these kinds of things. But they're everything from sort of manage my system, know what's on there, know how it's configured, know when it's not supposed to be on there test myself, scan for vulnerabilities. None of these are trivial. Right? These are not, the 20, it doesn't mean 20 easy steps. But these are the basics, the hygiene, the 80-20, do them because they need to get done. They give you great power against simple adversaries, complex adversaries, etc. cetera. Um, I'll mention a couple because there's a lot of attention to a small number, even within this list. And by the way, no one does 20 major steps right up front. Right? You can't. You can't keep your boss's attention. There's not enough funding, et cetera. People, my experience has been working with uh, companies large and small. People tend to focus on like three to five things. That's kind of what you're able to track at a corporate level. These are kind of the typical sort of major, uh, major big bang for the buck kind of things. Uh, knowing what software is running, it's supposed to be running, and knowing what unauthorized stuff is not running. Uh, this is a controversial one, by the way. Number one is, um, and. If you're interested in the geeky details, I'll be glad to explain to you afterwards. But having good configurations, I mentioned moving to a, a, a standardized desktop in the DoD, that's what we were doing with number two. Uh, just patching your systems gives you great power against uh, lots of problems. It doesn't solve world hunger, but it gives you the ability to deal with sort of the 80% kind of uh, things that are due to flaws in software. 
and this notion of administrative privileges. So when you get phished, right, you respond to one of those emails that was mentioned earlier. But what it really does is it causes bad things to happen. You go to a web page, that web page, uh, unknown to you, causes software to execute on your machine, which causes things like escalation of privilege or uh, actions unknown to you that are happening with your privilege. You can do a lot to block that by having a special account. Uh, you, you don't want your top-level sysadmins, for example, browsing the web with full privilege. Because if they get fooled, really, really bad things happen. Ordinary users, not so much, but uh, your uh, senior administrators, you don't want to have that. But these are the kinds of things, again, I won't go into the technical issues, but the idea is that the whole point of the controls is about priority and about focus, not about world hunger. It's about how do we quickly get people focused on the things that they ought to do. But these are the basic principles of how we operate. There is no massive think tank anymore that's doing this. This is a community uh, activist kind of a movement. Right? My job, as I mentioned, is cat herder. If people ask me what I do, I tell them I'm a community activist. I get people to agree. Right? I try to get them to find common ground. And one of the beautiful things about the business that we call cybersecurity is that there are so many great people in it who are really smart and are real believers. And it's an, it is astounding and gratifying the kind of work that people will do voluntarily to help the community at large. And you can roam around, uh, if, you know, if you're web literate, look at all kinds of great examples of the work that people are choosing to do and to give away, to share with others, etc. What I do is provide them a vehicle or a means to do that, right? a place to go, a place to match the needs with what already exists. So um, you know, I mentioned uh, kind of the basic premise for me. If you need it, someone's already done it. Right? If you, whether it's a tool or an idea or an approach. So half the email I get is about, hey, uh, you know, we're in this industry trying to map the critical controls to um, to the NIST control catalog, you know, with, with these constraints on it. Has anybody done it? And my job is to go find somebody like that and find hook, hook you guys up. And then figure out is there some lesson there that we can extrapolate to everybody else in this community. Right? So creating a place that does that is really what my goal is. So open volunteers and what often gets missed, well, th that list of 20, by the way, we're not trying to produce a better list than anybody else. If you want a great list, go to NIST. They got lists of thousands of things you can do. And good luck with figuring out which one you want to do first, by the way. It's very complex, right? But the NIST work is intellectually really, really good. There's really smart folks. I know every one of them personally. They do a great job in terms of completeness and thoroughness and you know, the science behind it. It's all good. But then they kind of expect you to figure out what your priority is because it's your business, your mission, and so forth. Well, guess what? Most of us cannot do that on our own. We need help. What we provide is a way to focus that on there. But this is not about a better list. You can go to get a great list from the Australians, from my friends at NSA. Lots of great people give you a list. What we're building now is a support system to help you do something with that list. How can we negotiate or badger the vendor community to support these actions? How can we take on the fight of aligning this set of actions with the compliance and with law? Would we'll take that on for you. How can I do this information broker of you have a problem, they've got a solution. Who will build the mappings and how, where can we post them so that people can get access to them? This building a support community is what's been missing. It's not, it's not a better list. It's a way to do it, right? Help each other achieve success. That's the notion here. Um, we have always been focused on this, the underlying notion about how do I stop attacks. That's a really key part of this. That's going to be fundamental to the way we could continue to do this activity here. And that's why uh, I'll, I'll mention it briefly and wait might talk about it a little bit later. But this one thing we did with the Verizon report of last year was build a direct connection from the great analysis by the by Wade's folks at Verizon with the critical controls. Right? So if you look at the appendix or the end of the document, you know, they after all that analysis, all that great summary understanding. They come up with a list of, and by the way, here are the most important class classes of attack that we saw last year. We try to bundle them up into bins and so forth. And if you have this problem or you want to try to solve this problem, he points directly right, into the critical controls. We built a mapping together that allows us to say, not just here's the problem, but here are the steps that you can take to manage that problem in your enterprise. Right? 
we're going to do that now with uh, McAfee has agreed to do that with me and Symantec and, and several others. And we're building this model of what is the real problem? Who's got the real data? Who's got the real understanding? Folks like Waze. How can we then pull their knowledge and use it to drive the best decisions? Right? I think that's the way the community needs to operate. Because you, each of us at every agency or at every different place that we're working at cannot do that on our own. We can only do that as a collective. And by the way, what, what they're finding applies to you. And you can also pick and choose. If you decide that certain things that they're focused on don't apply to you, no problem. That's part of your threat model, right? Your understanding of your risk. You can make that choice to say, you know, they focus a lot on certain things like human things like bribery and so forth. You know, the, sort of, there's a number of human vectors in their data. You can decide, we've already got that handled through other means. Great. Then you don't, you don't have to worry about the critical controls part of that, right? You have a way to now knowingly make good choices about the thing. So this idea of simplification, priorities, that, that's just an underlying theme that we'll continue to focus on. And uh, un underlying all this is a focus on automation and standards. So I really believe this. I've watched this for the, in the DoD for, uh, for a long, long period of time. We need to, uh, we're counting on great human beings, I'm sure many of you are in the room out here, to manually sort of save us, right, to do all this hands-on work of tweaking configurations and access control lists and just a, a keep up with all the threat reporting that's flying in from everybody and the brother. You know, you're heroes for doing it, but we have to kind of redesign our enterprise nationally so that you don't have to do all this manually. So more of it is done automatically. And the only way to do that is through standards and through off-the-shelf <laughs> And that's why I, I continue to carry the flag for a lot of um, uh, things in, in open standards for security. So what's next? Um, Jim hinted at this. What we decided uh, over the winter was the critical controls got so big that uh, it was time to separate it from the uh, corporate uh, machinery that is the SANS Institute. So a few weeks ago, we announced something, uh, the formation of a not new nonprofit company, the Council on Cybersecurity. I'll give you a link at the end here. It talks about kind of what the next stage is going to be. Um, but the actual ownership, leadership of the controls moves away from a for-profit company into a non-profit, international, independent cult council. And I'm moving with it. So I'm now um, the, what's called the director of programs. That's why I had more than one job, job title on the original slide for this Council on Cybersecurity, which frankly sits, consists of four of us sitting in the room staring at each other, figuring out how to organize the world on your behalf. So um, we're taking this problem on the uh, three, uh, leadership and cataloging here. The SANS Institute will continue to offer courses and posters and all that kind of stuff, you know, on the, on the for-profit side of this. And again, SANS is a great partner, a great community leader. But in terms of the adoption of the controls by governments, uh, in terms of playing neutral with industry and so forth, it was the right time to move this to a nonprofit status. So we have that. By the way, the CEO, my boss now, is the former Deputy Secretary of uh, Homeland Security, uh, Jane Lute, and she's an extraordinary woman, so this, this is a great partnership. You'll see there in the right side, people, technology, and policy. The, the approach that we we're taking, and I heard it mentioned in the, the talk about your, uh, your uh, uh, what was the name of it, the best practices group, or the, the sharing group here. You can't think of this purely as a technology problem. Right? You have to think of the people part of this, as well as technology, as well as policy, and you have to think of them all at the same time. Because they're often out of sync in our business. So policy is requiring your boss to spend money on things that may or may not align well with the right thing to do technically. And those cannot be allowed to, di to divert attention from each other. And we cannot afford to put in place defenses that are too complicated or too cumbersome for people to operate. It just makes no sense. So we're building kind of a, 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 a series of programs that allow us to do all these in parallel. To make sure that we recognize the human dimension part of this as well as the technology part and do it in alignment so the policy is taking us to the right spot. So these are really important big themes that we're taking on and that we, we uh, looked across the business and decided there needed to be an independent nonprofit international way to do this. So that, that's the formation of this council here. So I'm going to uh, kind of wind up my time um, on this. You know, this, this, this notion of best practice making it common is the, is the theme that I wanted to leave with you here. Because we are at a really important and pivotal time in the business. You know, I, I didn't have to scare you, right? There were some, some, uh, some of the opening remarks. You, you guys know what this problem is about, right? If, if your credit union or merchant hasn't 
sent you a letter at some point in the last few years telling you about your credit card being lost and we're going to issue you a new one, then you are living on a rock someplace because that's just become part of the part of life. You know, issuing new credit cards and we're going to give you a credit reporting for another year or two or whatever. Oh my gosh, this is affecting everybody, right? And the cost of this is being eaten by us as a society. And some of it's not even being felt yet. It's the theft of intellectual property going to other nations that are outbuilding us with our own ideas. This is it. This is a important and pivotal time for us to behave differently than we have in the past. So we hear some great signs. You know, I heard some of the, the discussion about what's going to happen in West Virginia, about sharing and so forth. Right on the money. These are the kind of things that we have to do as a community. My offer to you is whatever I can do to help you synchronize this with some of the national activities that I've mentioned here. The international things through the council, etc. This is you know, this is what I got after 35 years of service in the uh, in public side. Uh, you know, I couldn't walk away from it. I wasn't interested in kind of sort of the classic consulting kind of stuff. Uh, my job, you know, for better or for worse, is to herd cats in the community. So I invite you to be part of the herd. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. Um, I think there's a break time here. I do, I cannot stay till the end of the day. My apologies. If you have any questions or any follow up, please don't hesitate to. Uh, uh, catch me out the hallway afterwards, or uh, I'll leave you contact information here. One is the um, uh, the council's uh, website, the brand new website, and then my my uh, email address at the council. But please feel free to uh, any questions that you have or any opportunities that we have to work together on this kind of stuff. Please just let me know. So with that, thank you all very much.